Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, experts discuss the results of the first ever beef industry sustainability assessment. A look at the progress being made towards a more sustainable future. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Thanks for joining us. Sustainability. It's become a popular buzzword in the beef industry over the last several years. But what does it really mean and who does it impact? Beef industry experts set out to conduct a first-of-its-kind study funded by the Beef Checkoff, analyzing the sustainability of our industry from gate to plate. It's called the Beef Industry Sustainability Assessments, and it's providing some important science-based information about beef production. Today, we're fortunate to have some experts here in the studio with us to discuss some of those key findings. And joining us in the studio is Dr. Kim Stackhouse Lawson. She's the Director of Sustainability Research and Manager of the Beef Sustainability Research Project for NCBA, a contractor, of course, to the Beef Checkoff. Dr. Bo Reagan, he's the Senior Vice President of Research, Education, and Innovation for NCBA, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. And Scott George, the current <laughs> NCBA President and also a dairy farmer and cow-calf producer from Cody, Wyoming. Thank you all for coming to the show and being with us today. Now, before we jump into our discussion, let's take a little bit of time to better understand what sustainability is and why it's important to our industry. It's a first of its kind look at the sustainability of our great industry. The beef industry now has information about our sustainability from cradle to grave. The beef checkoff funded assessment provides a benchmark for the industry to monitor progress toward a more sustainable future. The preliminary results were rolled out in January to industry leaders. Those results show that the beef industry has an exciting opportunity to, for the first time, tell its story of sustainable beef production backed by science. The first ever beef industry sustainability assessment shows progress made over past decades. The assessment measures beef's contribution to the U.S., utilizing environmental, economic, and social measurements. As we better understand the consumer, and understand that this is a concern of theirs, this whole arena of sustainability, and that we are not just uh, sort of sticking our head in the ground, that we are in fact acting on it uh, is, uh, is, pretty, uh, is pretty positive and speaks, uh, I think speaks volumes for our industry, that we are proactive, that we are trying to get in front of uh, the issues that are facing our protein. I think most of us recognize is that we're in this thing together. Um, you know, it's not about the cow-calf or feeders or packers or the retailers. It's about delivering the best product to the consumer in, in the most sustainable way. And I think that's really the core message that we have here is that each of the sectors have opportunities to improvement. But as we become more efficient together, then that's where the big impacts are going to be. To date, no other industry has completed a holistic life cycle assessment on its full production chain. Beef producers are now positioned to lead the discussion with other protein groups, consumers, non-governmental organizations, and other influencers. I'm actually really encouraged to see this effort going on. I think it's critically important, and I think that this is an example of where the beef industry is a leader. The others will follow. The other livestock sectors will follow. Dairy has done a lot of work too, more focusing on carbon footprint. The beef industry is looking more at the whole sustainability area, including carbon footprint, but not limiting itself to it. And so what I really appreciate about this project is the complexity. It really looks uh, across many different areas, and that's um, a game changer. I think the U.S. beef industry can establish itself as a leader, not just in this country, but even globally, in establishing indicators for sustainability. The big picture is, and it's part of the game, is, is that it's not only feeding people now, it's making sure that we can also feed people 10 years from now, and 50 years from now, and 100 years from now. And, and so it's a process of thinking, uh, as Bob Budd, a rancher in Wyoming, says, learning to think at the pace of rocks and mountains while learning to act in our own lifetimes. 
To learn more about the preliminary results of the Beef Industry Sustainability Assessment, visit beefresearch.org. Well, that was a great overview of sustainability, and now I'd like to begin our discussion with our experts. Kim, let's kick it off with you. How do you define sustainability, and what does it mean to our industry? Yeah, so sustainability is a tricky word because 100 people will have 100 different answers. Um, beef has defined sustainability as being larger than the traditional sustainability um, definition of just carbon footprint or greenhouse gas emissions. And really, the beef industry was interested in understanding um, a more balanced approach to sustainability that included a measurement of beef's contributions in environmental responsibility, economic opportunity, and social diligence. And Bo, tell us, what is the beef industry's sustainability assessment and, and, and why is it so important in your opinion? Well, it, it's so important to us because we know that our global population is growing by leaps and bounds. And we're hearing that by 2050, we need to produce 70% more food than we do today. We believe if we're going to meet that challenge, it's very important for beef to be at the table. We have to be part of that equation. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this assessment study. We're looking all the way, look at each step of the way as we go from the cow-calf guy all the way to the consumer so that we can look at the inputs and the outputs there so that when the study is completely finished, we can go back and see where we can increase our efficiencies uh, along that chain. The other thing people need to understand is this study, as you mentioned earlier, this is the largest sustainability study ever done. We're setting new standards for sustainability, and why that's important to us is that with us being in the global market, we need to be setting those standards. We need to be at the table. We need to be part of that discussion. And we believe with this study, with us setting the new standards for sustainability work, that we will be able to lead that discussion, which is important for U.S. producers. Now, this assessment, as I understand, was funded by the Beef Checkoff. And Scott, maybe tell us a little bit more about why the Checkoff chose to invest its resources in this assessment. Well, you know, for years, the cattle industry has faced a lot of scrutiny. And, and we've been hearing we need to be more sustainable. You need to be greener. We and the cattle producers have always felt like we have been very good caretakers of the land and the water and the cattle we work with. But we, uh, we've been viewed as biased because we are producers. What we've lacked is a scientific study that where we literally had the information, we could stand up and say, look, this shows that we are being sustainable. Since this affects all cattle producers, irregardless of what sector the, of the cattle raising business they're in, and because all cattle producers pay the checkoff, we thought it entirely appropriate that the checkoff be used as the funding mechanism to conduct this study because it will benefit all of us and it will help reassure our consumers. And, and I guess, uh, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that because my perception is we have had a sustainable industry. But, Bo, why is measuring sustainability so important all of a sudden? Well, you're, you're right. We've made great progress through the years. The issue is that our consumers and our customers today are more demanding than ever. They're asking for more transparency. We will know how you produce our food. But they're also asking us the question, how sustainable is your in industry? And so what we need to do is that we do not have the data. We did not have the data. We did not have the database. And so that's another thing that's associated with this particular project. We now have the database so we can respond with accurate data to not only the consumers, and, but also to the greatest critics that we have. We have the data to defend what we're seeing. And, and Kim, maybe give us some insight. There seems to be a lot of variables uh, here that, that, that factor into overall industry sustainability. How is it even scientifically possible to measure all those variables? Right. So we use what's called a life cycle assessment to measure sustainability. And in its simplest definition, it's just really an accounting system of all inputs and outputs. So that's most tangible to understand when you look at the pre-harvest um, sectors of our industry. So the packing and case ready and retail sectors. And if you think about the way that the consumer buys beef, it's in a styrofoam package. So for example, um, that styrofoam and that plastic would be inputs. So we account for those and then account for those outputs. Now on the pre-harvest side, it's, it's a little more difficult, right? Because we know that there's so much biological variability. So we use dynamic computer models that are based in math and predict weather emissions for every minute over 25 years. So there's equations that then take into account temperature, rain, soil type, um, maybe 
you know, grass type. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we can basically predict those biological inputs like forage growth or cattle growth to, to understand full chain sustainability. Well, no doubt sustainability is a complex topic, but uh, you all have done a wonderful job providing some foundational understanding upon which we can build for today's discussion. Ahead on this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, experts from the pre-harvest and post-harvest uh, side of the beef industry discuss what it means to be sustainable and the importance of sustainability in feeding a growing global population. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. When it comes to versatility on your operation, nothing beats a John Deere D Series skid steer. They're not only great for cleaning and feed chores, but with John Deere Worksite Pro attachments, you can tackle just about any job thrown your way. You asked for versatility and John Deere delivered. These rock solid machines are built to last. See your dealer today. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattlemen provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right. Where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my family a home-cooked meal, that's important to me. That's important to me. And planting the garden and watching it grow. Welcome back. Demand for beef continues to be strong, but when it comes to the beef that ends up on their tables, consumers have a lot of questions about how it's produced and how sustainable it is. The Beef Industry Sustainability Assessment, funded by the Beef Checkoff, helps answer those very questions. And it also includes key findings from each segment of the industry, starting with the pre-harvest side of the production chain. Kim Stackhouse Lawson and Scott George uh, are back with us in the studio to talk more about the sustainability assessment. And joining them are John Butler, he's the chief executive officer of the Beef Marketing Group, and Bill Kowser, founder of Kowser Cattle Company in Nevada, Iowa. Bill and his family are also the 2010 National Environmental Stewardship Award winners. Thanks again for joining us on this panel. We're anxious for a, another good discussion. And Kim, I wanted to start with you. Mm -hmm. I noticed that you selected the 1970s, 2005, and 2011 as key points to collect data for this life cycle ass assessment. Tell us a little bit about the rationale behind that. Sure, so continuous improvement over time is a, is a very important aspect of sustainability. And so we first wanted to benchmark that with the 2011 data, you know, where, where are we today? But we also felt it was important to look back in time to understand how our sustainability has improved. So the late 60s and early 70s represent the time period just before boxed beef, when we were still shipping swinging sides. And then 2005 represents the time period where we started to include distiller's grains in our feed yard diets and ethanol became a very important part um, of our beef production supply chain. And Scott, maybe you can highlight a few of the key results that, uh, that you learned from this pre-harvest segment. 
the results were really fascinating to me because they showed that we are definitely increasing and improving over time. Uh, we don't produce the cattle the same way today that we did in, in the 1970s. We have made some dramatic increases. Uh, for example, uh, just some of the ideas of, of things that have been brought out. Uh, we've improved grazing practices. We used to put cattle out on a big pasture and they grazed the whole thing and then it was done. We've learned that rotational grazing or even intentional, intensive grazing will yield more grass which yields more pounds of beef. That's one area. Other areas, we've, we've focused more, uh, producers are more concerned about the genetics. Mm -hmm. Making sure they've got the right cattle that can thrive, not only survive, but can literally thrive in the environment that they're living in. Mm -hmm. And those cattle are becoming more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking also, we see better management of how we handle the cattle, how we work with them, and also more, more attention to nutrition. All of these things have increased the production we're doing. We're finding out that we are producing more with less, which is the goal of sustainability. Absolutely. And, and John, I'd be interested in uh, your thoughts uh, as you think about the data that was collected, both of the cow-calf as well as the feed yard segment. Uh, do you believe that data is really representative of the entire nation? Um, you know, Kevin, it's a good question. As, as we looked at the beginnings of this trial or this life cycle assessment, that was certainly a question I had as a feed yard um, in feed yard management myself. And the Meat Animal Research Center in, uh, in Nebraska had the data uh, available. And then, and then what we did is we, we took that data and tried to emulate it against our data from one of our feed yards. So we took one of our 30,000 head feed yards, a commercial, represented commercial feed yard, and compared the data. And when we say data, for example, feed conversion, how much feed it takes to put on a pound of gain, as an example. And it was very similar to the data that was uh, up at, at Mark or Meat Animal Research Center. So we, and I'm not a scientist, but we were very convinced that it, it does replicate uh, commercial feeding enterprises. And Bill, you well know that producers already do so much to care for the environment and to manage natural resources. How do you think this information is going to help do a better job of that? Well, Kevin, one of the things that we've learned that we need to do more of and we're doing a lot of today is tell our story, is to get people to our farms and ranches and let them touch it, smell it, and feel it. And when, when we look at how we tell our story, we bring people in to help explain what we do there. We're very heavily involved in, in alternative technology, so we're, we're worried about the environment. We're, we're concerned about how we can take care of those practices. We've worked with science to uh, involve the building of, of different structures because in the Midwest we have the weather that we have to mm -hmm. be concerned about and the, the terrible extremes. And then also with the ethanol industry there we have uh, many different uh, feedstuffs that we're able to uh, utilize. So when we look at our whole system here it's all about us telling our story to the public out there and getting those people to our farms and ranches. John, maybe you could highlight um, a few of the innovations that have helped improve the environmental footprint uh, of the pre-harvest segment. There's been a number, uh, especially when you look at the, at the timeline that uh, is involved in this assessment, um, uh, starting, uh, for example, with um, animal health practices. Uh, and, and this goes to perhaps enhance coordination and communication between my segment, the feeding segment, and the ranching segment, and where we collaborate uh, way more than we used to in mm. terms of uh, sharing information, specifically as I referenced animal health. So the cattle uh, come to us preconditioned. Mm. Uh, that's, that's a relatively, it's not that new, but it, in the time frame we're looking at, there's a much higher percentage of cattle that now are preconditioned and fully weaned before we get them in the feeding segment, which makes a healthier animal, a more efficient animal, and so on. The genetics is another good example, where we've been able to share information on how cattle perform and, and really capitalize on the best genetics and replicate that. So we have, a, again, a, another a more efficient, higher quality, more consistent product that we can provide for the consumer. There's other things that we've, uh, we've been able to do within in the feed yard that uh, are opportunities. Um, uh, for, for example, um, uh, delivery of feed stuffs. Uh, we, we now uh, have figured out by, by the better rations that we produce and we, we produce those on our operations and, and how we deliver those to cattle. For, for example, now in the last two years, in two of our operations, we now use two less 
feed trucks. Hmm. So we are able to deliver the cattle, deliver the feed to the cattle on a more consistent basis, but actually with two less feed trucks, which is less gasoline and less exhaust and so on. So there's just a whole host of uh, improvements that we've been able to make over this time frame um, that, that have resulted in a, in a much more efficient uh, system and, and much more uh, environmentally uh, compliant. And Bill, what pre-harvest innovations might you add? Well, I think today, Kevin, when I put my farmer cap on, I look at my practices that I utilize in the field. Today we have GMOs, that uh, corn, corn brands and soybean brands, that the drought that we just went through last year, it's probably one of the best crops that we've had in central Iowa, just because of some, a few of the little rains that we had. Mm -hmm. We look at some of the bug problems that we've had over the past few years, and today we can control them with much less different things, or it's GMOs that are put into that, so we no longer have to handle that as humans. We look at manure management. Um, it's, it's huge on our farms today because it's eliminated commercial fertilizer. Commercial fertilizer is foreign oil. And when we take those natural nutrients back to our farms and our fields, and we look at what happens with the yields as they come up because of that natural cycle that goes on, mm -hmm. uh, we're just on the cutting edge of, of becoming better with IFS programs and planter systems to uh, feed programs that we're developing through the renewable fuels industry. You know, we have a lot to be proud of, but Scott, uh, from a cow-calf producer's perspective, I'd be interested, what are some improvement opportunities from, from that sector? There are things we're always looking to try to improve. One of them, obviously, as a cow-calf producer, is trying to re uh, work on reproductive efficiencies. Sure. Uh, synchronization programs today are offering some great opportunities to producers because they can get all those cows ready to cycle at the same time, you get a more uniform calf crop. We're focusing on, on getting a greater uh, conception rate. All of those things make us more efficient. Another area that we really have an area to, or an area to work in is on how we handle our cattle. Uh, research keeps telling us that consumers really want to know about how the animals are handled and that they're handled well. Uh, we've developed through the Checkoff program the Beef Quality Assurance Program and for the dairy producers the Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Program. Uh, that program has been devised with the input from cow-calf producers or, or producers themselves, veterinarians, animal handling specialists, and it's a voluntary program that we as producers can participate in, learning the best techniques, the best way to handle our cattle, the best management practices that are available for us today. And this is something that all producers could do on their own. And this is reassuring to the consumer when you say, you know, I'm BQA certified, or I'm dairy beef QA certified. I'm following the best practices that are out there. It's a great point. Kim, what additional insights would you have from a cow-calf perspective? Well, I think the point that Scott just raised about um, becoming BQA certified is a, is a really important one because animal welfare is actually the number one sustainability concern. Mm. Um, but really, the pre-harvest sector and the post-harvest sector has just been done a tremendous job, and they everyone should be very proud of the improvements that we've been able to achieve in such a short amount of time. Um, on the pre-harvest side, there is a gap in the research, and that gap is centered around what, what we refer to as biodiversity, mm. or really those very complex interactions of grazing and wildlife and open space, and how the rancher really contributes to that. And sustainability is really in its infancy in terms of research, and certainly life cycle assessment is very young too. And we haven't necessarily figured out how biodiversity fits into that equation. So that's going to be very important research going forward and something that we're working on right now um, in the, with the research team. Very good. And John, from the feedlot sector, what might be some opportunities for improvement looking forward? Well, um, it, it pick up on what these two have said, the, the BQA program is very prevalent in the feed yard sector as well. And in fact, there's systems out there that allow us to measure, to actually validate that these uh, best management practices are being adhered to. So once you get that, you can, you can improve from there. Once you put a line in the sand and you measure that, you can, in, you can then identify strategies and objectives to improve. And, and the life cycle assessment has really forced us down that path. And there's a number of programs out there that, that will allow that to happen, allow you take that beef quality assurance initiative to the next level. So we're, we're very excited about that. There's always in the feed yard uh, sector, there's always ways that, that we're looking at 
uh, for, for enhancements. Um, examples might include um, the feed that we deliver to the cattle mm -hmm. and how we can make a, even a more enhanced, nutritionally balanced feedstuff for the animals. Uh, and there's opportunities there with uh, better utilizing resources that are available to us. Um, another, another area that we're looking at is where we actually bring the cattle to our operations from. Mm -hmm. If we can shorten that distance, then of course you, you've made a less impact on the amount of diesel that's used to move those cattle from one operation to the next. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to improve, but the, but the main thing in this that, that is so valuable to us is putting a line in the sand to establish where we are today. And I appreciate the pat on the back that, that we've done good so far, but really our challenge is where do we take it from here and how do we keep that trend moving forward? That's a great point. And, you know, we've talked a lot about production and efficiency. I guess, Kim, I'd ask you, um, how do you scientifically measure the social impact? So that's that's a great question, and when we add social um, diligence into the sustainability equ equation, it really allows us to understand beef's contributions to communities. Mm. So a few examples of how that was included um, with quantifiable numbers are things like occupational illnesses and accidents, mm. food safety, and animal welfare. So it really allows us to bring a quality of life aspect into the sustain sustainability conversation. And Bill, tell us how your sector and maybe your own personal business contributes to your own community. Well, Kevin, everyone watching this program today is, is very excited about their own personal communities. And when you look at ours in Nevada, Iowa, we have an ethanol plant there. It also produces seed production there, and we also grow crops. Mm. So we talk about um, being environmentally friendly, but we also talk about keeping those dollars at home. Mm. We're now processing those different products that are there. We're bringing uh, the protein and fiber back to the feedlot and, and putting that through or walking our animals to town. Uh, we're also selling some grain. And when we look at, at the communities that we're involved in, all those tax dollars and, and dollars go back to our communities as far as the fire department, the, uh, the teaching facilities, and our roads. So when we look long term, we're renewable, mm -hmm. we're sustainable, we're environmentally friendly, but we're also profitable. And what that's allowed us to do in our communities is bring our sons and daughters back home today and to, to carry on this tremendous tradition that we have and let them figure out how the future is going to go and build on this study as we go down the road. I would say that's a pretty big societal impact. And John, what might you add? You have a little different type of operation in a little different part of the country. How do you contribute to your own community? S similar attributes. Um, I guess uh, we, we really do focus on um, enhancing the communities in which we um, operate. And it, it varies from uh, making sure that we purchase the farming uh, produce and, and products that we can uh, from those operations local mm. and we sort of have a goal within 25 miles of each of our operation we try example to buy all the corn that's available mm -hmm. to because in our farming operation we can't produce enough to feed the cattle so we actually focus on uh, supporting that local farmer uh, and having a market for that product that comes into our operations. Uh, in addition, we're, we're very involved in the communities from an employment standpoint. Mm -hmm. Our operations are, are pretty significant and, and uh, we, we're very involved in um, uh, employing the personnel that's available in those communities. And it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, we have very low turnover with mm -hmm. those type of local type of individuals because there's a commitment that goes both ways. It's, mm -hmm. I don't want to give the impression that we're the all end all. It goes both ways. They they like to work in, in the local communities and we have an operation that allows that to happen and, and really allow that sustainability to happen in that community and be solid. And Kim, uh, let's talk next steps. Uh, what are the next steps in terms of research from a pre-harvest standpoint? So the most important next steps will be collecting regional data so that we can have regional sustainability assessments across the U.S. And the reason for this is simple, right? So cattle production is different in Florida than it is in northeastern Washington or, or northwestern Washington. And Scott, uh, let's think about the future from your perspective. Do you think this will be repeated, this study will be repeated in order to fundamentally track our progress over time? This study would have to be repeated again. Uh, like Kim mentioned, we've, we've looked at the 1970s, 2005, 2011. We've got to continue to see that we're making continued improvement. And the only way to do that is to conduct the study again. And so, yes, it will obviously be repeated. Well, there's uh, a lot to be proud of, but clearly some improvement opportunities that uh, we all have from a pre-harvest standpoint. I really appreciate your insight. We have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll engage in a discussion with experts who are involved with the post-harvest sector of the beef industry. Stay with us. You don't want to miss it.
Merck Animal Health, we are dedicated to improving the health and well-being of animals through innovative science-based solutions, products, treatments, and services to ensure a dependable, affordable food supply. From cattleman to consumer, from farm to family, we're with you every step of the way. We work where you work. What drives you drives us. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. I'm an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because I think uh, as an advocacy group, NCBA has done some great things for our industry and I kind of feel compelled to, to give back some of what they've done for us. Because this organization is looking out for cattle producers. They understand what makes our cow-calf business profitable. Join me today. Join me today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Check us out at cattlemantocattleman.org or on Facebook and Twitter. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. And New Holland round balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland round balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. Welcome back. We're learning about the sustainability of our great industry. We've talked with experts about what sustainability means in the pre-harvest sector. And now I'd like to turn it over to the folks from the post-harvest side of things. And joining us in the studio is Dr. Bo Reagan. He's the Senior Vice President of Research, Education and Innovation for NCBA, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. We also have Jessica Drosty Yagen. Director of Sustainable Supply Chain with McDonald's USA. Craig Mello, he's the Risk Manager for Agribeef. And last but not least, Cindy Chan Phillips. She's a registered dietitian and the Director of Nutrition Education for the New York Beef Industry Council. Welcome to the show. Bo, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about some of the issues in the pre-harvest sector. Uh, are the issues and concerns of the post-harvest sector similar or different? No, they're, they're, they're similar from the standpoint that when we look at the different sectors, they're all part of, of the sustainability chain. I think one way that a lot of people looked at sustainability, they've tried to isolate one sector. But what we've done in this study, in this true assessment, we go all the way from the cow cap, as we mentioned earlier, going all the way to the consumer. So the only thing that's really different is, is the inputs from the standpoint uh, uh, say our packers use more energy, they may be getting their energy from from another source and what we do on the farm pre-harvest side. Uh, we use more packaging materials there. So from the standpoint of if there's any differences, it's only looking at, at the inputs that we have going in for that sector. And Craig, maybe you could share specifically what kind of data was collected. Uh, still went and turned through this process. I was uh, really surprised by the, the, the amount of detail and the went, that took place through this data collection process. Uh, being directly involved, you know, the typical wastewater, air emissions, water emissions, um, or, you know, some of the key indicators, but we went to the level of looking at how much adhesive, you know, went into a box or actually how many sheets of toilet paper are on a roll of toilet paper. Hmm. Um, it's just, you know, a, a, an indication of, of the level of detail that wow. went uh, into this. And Bo, uh, maybe you could share uh, just a few of the highlights of the results relative to the post-harvest sector. Well, uh, we, you know, we looked at the last seven years from 205 to 211. 
uh, on the post harvest side, and we really saw some significant changes there. You know, from the standpoint of energy, from the standpoint of water emissions, and one of the big ones that. Uh, really caught my attention was from the standpoint of transportation. Hmm. But, you know, as we were starting this study, we looked at some data from the 70s, and it said back then we were transporting about 175 pounds of fat and bone from each carcass down, down the road back then. Hmm. Today, we're transporting less than four pounds. So again, that will give you a little feel for some of the significant differences and uh, changes we're finding. And, and Craig, what are some of the factors that have contributed to the improvements uh, in the packing sector? Uh, there's been, I'll give you a, a few examples. Uh, looking back from the 70s to today, uh, we've reduced our water emissions uh, by 71% um, through a process of water reclamation back into our, our plants. Uh, another good example would be uh, is the recapturing of our uh, biogas that has reduced our energy use by 18%. And Jessica, I know McDonald's is really committed to su uh, sustainability. Uh, tell us, what do you believe McDonald's efforts in this area of sustainability have meant to the improvements the beef industry has made? I hope we've re you know, um, reflected well upon the beef industry. We certainly serve a lot of beef and we've put a lot of effort into sustainability. We really try to look at sustainability in terms of how can we grow our business by making a positive impact on society. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. Um, I'll give you one example. And that is, you know, we have 14,000 restaurants more or less in the United States. Mm -hmm. And of course we use a lot of energy or electricity in those restaurants to co cook things like hamburgers. Um, and you know, it's really a win-win where we can grow our business, reduce costs, reduce electricity, mm -hmm. as well as improve our environmental footprint at the same time. And there's many more examples like that. Well, and, and maybe you share some more of those. I'm interested, why is this so important at the food service sector? It's really critically important to the food service, center, food service sector. I mean, this is really about serving food, right? And we have mm -hmm. to have food. Um, you know, Ray Kroc really built McDonald's on the foundation of what he called the three-legged stool. Um, the corporation, the franchisees, and the supply chain. And really when you look at the supply chain, it's not just about our direct suppliers for McDonald's, but it's the entire value chain that produces that food that we need to serve to our customers. So when we look at sustainability, it's really about the future strength and viability of every part of that value chain back to the, to the farmers, to the processors, and everybody in between. And, and Cindy, uh, from a consumer perspective, do you think they're paying attention to this type of research and, and will this type of an assessment help us get our message across to consumers? Well, consumers are paying attention to where the food comes from and also the fact that the food is raised in a sustainable way. And I think this life cycle analysis helps the consumers understand that beef is a sustainable food. And as important as the results, that we need to stress that this is a very comprehensive scope of looking at from farm to plate, as well as the transparency nature of this project. And we need to communicate these important aspects with the consumers and help them understand that they can play a very important role in sustainability by reducing food waste. American consumers waste about 40 million tons of food you know, every year. And a one good place to start is portion control. Portion control along with a balanced diet and physical activity. Good for, your, good for your health. So portion control is good for the individuals as well as good for the environment. And Jessica, how would you respond from your customer's perspective? Do you think they're paying attention to this kind of work? I think there's no doubt that our customers want to know more and more about where their food comes from and how it's produced. You know, may they, they might not get into the, the nitty gritty detail of a life cycle assessment, um, you know, like the folks here would, but it's really important that those types of um, data and research exist mm -hmm. to have those proof points behind the trust and transparency that this type of communication can provide. And Craig, uh, what are some of the biggest improvement opportunities from your segment of the industry? Uh, we recognize the importance of our relationships with our supplier and vendors and the efficiencies um, that could be had from production standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. our impact uh, from a regulatory standpoint, mm -hmm. um, the importance of, uh, of implementation of uh, animal welfare program and how that uh, impacts the consumer. And Jessica, what improvements might you see from a food service perspective? 
We have a lot of room for improvement for sure, and we're putting a lot of effort, especially at our restaurant level. So when mm -hmm. you think about the food itself, you know, the tr nutritional aspects of that, um, the environmental impacts of our restaurants, our employees, our impacts on local communities. So we've got a lot of stuff going on there. Um, but also I wanted to just address our supply chain. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, it's not technically ours, so to speak, but it's really important to us. And I talked before about the three-legged stool and the importance of the stability of that industry and the sustainability of that industry moving forward. And that's that's true across the board, across all the food that we that we need to serve. So I look forward to continuing as part of our work, also collaborating with and supporting the beef industry and other industries along the way. It's great news. And Cindy, let's not forget about consumers. Uh, what improvement opportunities do we have there? There are many opportunities that consumers can do within the household, including uh, recycling and food composting. But look, not everyone can do food composting, but everyone can reduce food waste. And um, you know, people are beginning to talk about it, but not enough. But I think the timing is right. People, consumers are paying more attention to reducing food waste when the economy is soft. Mm. One great opportunity is with engaging the millenniums. This is what we know from research. Number one, they are very conscious about the environment. And secondly, they are hungry for information. And thirdly, they need support in the cooking <laughs> skills. It's interesting enough is according to the Dietary Guideline for Americans 2010, improving cooking skills can be one way to eat healthier. Mm. So improving cooking skills can be good for your nutrition as well as reducing food waste as well. I want to mention about my fellow um, food and nutrition professionals. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage them to bring awareness, to promote mm -hmm. reducing food waste at the household level as part of their nutrition education interaction with the consumers. That's a great recommendation. But one last question. Uh, how does this work position the beef industry in comparison to other food chains in regards to this topic of sustainability? Well, I think it positions us very well because as we talked earlier, th this is a game changer mm. for sustainability work. If you look at what a lot of the other industries have done, the total focus has been on the in environmental side. We're here, we've talked about the environment side, the importance of economics, and then we also have, have the social side. And, and the reason we did that, as we've talked to stakeholders, what we're finding is that the old definition of, of sustainability was totally focused on environment. They've moved beyond that now. They're interested in socially what we're doing there. They're certainly interested in, in the economic side. So again, this is a game changer, and uh, we're, we're really proud that, that we did study and we're moving forward. Well, I appreciate your insight of this really demonstrates the comprehensive nature of this study. When we return, uh, we'll have uh, some final thoughts from each of our panelists regarding sustainability. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. This business can take time away and become more of your family than your actual family. My days were tough. I had a lot of doctoring, a lot of pulling. Now our days on the feed yard are happy days. It's more about looking at the cattle and enjoying what we're producing versus the alternative, which is pull and treat and bang our head against the wall. We have never wavered from Draxon. We've seen the benefits just keep getting better and better. I'm Kevin Oxter, host of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Join me Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern, right here on RFD-TV. Ever wonder where the beef checkoff dollar goes and what it buys? The Federation of State Beef Councils is made up of the 45 qualified state beef councils that collect the $1 per head beef checkoff. Each council keeps control of 50 cents and sends 50 cents to the Cattlemen's Beef Board for use in national beef checkoff programs. Many states also choose to send a portion of their share to the Federation to expand national and international efforts. As a division of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the Federation of State Beef Councils works to support an effective state and national partnership 
helping to increase beef demand through research, promotion, and education. Because producers themselves direct these programs, your beef checkoff dollars are in good hands. Learn more about the Federation of State Beef Councils by visiting beefusa.org. So why do you care if your cattle are source and age verified? Better yet, do you think the housewife cares? Well, 70% of consumers surveyed want to know where their food comes from. So where do you start? With this little green ear tag. IMI Global, the seal of approval that stands behind the beef you produce. IMI is engaged in source and age verification from the cow man to the kitchen table. So if you're ready to start, just ask us. IMIGlobal.com Let's face it, you don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it and forget it. We understand, but at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, long hauls, never-ending chores, the unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B&W, trusted. Most of us in our daily lives have occasion to be a good Samaritan, to help someone in need, like stopping to help a stranded motorist or feed the neighbor's dogs and horses while they're away. However, in spite of our good intentions, our generosity can backfire, like offering to tune Willie Nelson's guitar, <laughs> or as a surprise, cutting down the big oak tree in the neighbor's yard so they can have a better view of the reclaimed open pit mine. I ran into Scott at the wheat growers meeting. He reminded me that he'd come to a poetry gathering I had done. He'd worried that he would not be able to get a good seat. But, he said, to my good fortune, I managed to get a single on the fourth row center. It was great, he told me. There was lots of fancy looking cowgirls prancing down the aisle. Maybe one or even two would have the seats next to mine. Well, five minutes before the curtain rose, he heard the usher escorting an elderly lady down the aisle with her walker. They stopped at the end of his row. Those seated rose so she could work her way to the seat right next to him. Well, the usher left her walker in the aisle. Scott said the lady was nice and laughed a lot. She managed to stand up during the patriotic piece and and later at the conclusion of the show. As she stood to leave, she tottered and seemed to collapse. Well, Scott slid his hands underneath her armpits and caught her. She was so light, so frail, he remembered. She said something he didn't catch and then toppled over again. Well, once more he stepped in to save the day. Why don't you just sit down and I'll go get your walker? She turned and looked up at Scott. I was trying to tell you, Sonny, the usher's got my walker and is waiting for me, and if you'll just let me pick up my purse, I'll go. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. You have a way of keeping us entertained with your great stories. Well, we've spent the last hour talking about the sustainability of the beef industry from farm to fork. And now I'd like to get a few closing remarks from several of our panelists. John, let's start with you. If you could summarize, what do you believe are some of the things that have helped our industry improve our sustainability? Well, I really feel like that uh, technology has played a key role, um, especially in the time frame that we've looked at. And technology from every segment, whether it be farming and the, and the crop production and how we've been able to advance there uh, up to the cow-calf operation and, and how the, how the uh, genetics have played a role and, and the advancing technology we've been able to utilize there and, and even into the feeding situation where we've got growth enha enhancement technologies that have really helped us along the path of becoming more sustainable, more efficient, 
um, being able to produce more with less. And I, I really feel like that if I had to put one mark on the map, that, that probably is the one for me around technology that has really advanced our industry in this area of sustainability. And do you think sustainability is here to stay? I really do. You know, I don't, I don't, think, it's a, uh, I don't think it's a trend. Uh, I, I, I think it's here forever. Um, when you look at uh, the pressures we're receiving from the consumer to know more about the food they're consuming, uh, specifically the protein, uh, where it comes from, how we as caretakers of those animals and of that land uh, are responsible, th there, is, there is a certain need for that and, that. and that falls into this whole definition, this whole arena of sustainability. So uh, once you get into the consumer uh, marketplace, I really feel like that uh, you put a stake in the ground and it's here for long term. And Kim, do you think we'll be able to look back at some point in the future and say, yes, our industry truly is sustainable, we've achieved our goal? Well, this is, the, the industry is sustainable today, and that's why doing this sort of research and benchmarking where we're, where we're at today, drawing that line in the sand is so important so that we can continue to have the most sustainable product tomorrow as well. So, Scott, will this focus on sustainability help unite our industry? It should. <clears throat> you know, the fact that this study is not just looking at the the environmental impact, it's looking at the environmental, the, the social and the profit uh, component is very uh, a broad based look. Uh, we're looking at the cow calf sector, we're looking at the feeder sector, we're looking at the harvest sector, the case ready sector, the retailers and the food service and the consumer at the end. Mm -hmm. Because every one of us have a role to play in this whole sustainability of beef. And you know, it's, it, I think this is very interesting to me because we're, so for so long we've been the focus of all the attention saying you've got to be sustainable, but we're suddenly coming out and saying, hey, even the consumer has a role to play. Mm -hmm. If you drive 20 miles for a steak dinner in your Hummer, that's not quite as sustainable. <laughs> and, and so this, this is actually helping the whole value chain come together and be united. And Kim, one last question. Mm -hmm. What can individual beef producers watching the show do to be more sustainable? Well, a one-size-fits-all approach is simply not sustainable. I think every um, producer has different pieces to the resource puzzle that they put together to produce the most sustainable beef that they can. And it's about that balanced approach to sustainability that includes profitability and efficiency. And that's really what's going to take us into, into the future with the most sustainable product that we've ever produced. Well, thank each of you and all of our panelists today for this cutting edge information and your personal insight into this very, very important topic. For more information on the Chekhov funded Beef Industry Sustainability Assessment, just log on to beefresearch.org. Well, that does it for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.